together is our prayer. Lord, that you would open our eyes to your truth, to be more loving and more compassionate and more like your son, Jesus Christ, each and every day, Lord. And all of God's people said, amen. Into marvelous 
Amen. God, as we continue to sing to you, as we think about what we are claiming through our worship, as we think about the love you've shown us, how you've transformed us from the inside out. God, we ask that we think about these things and we ponder them in our hearts. Holy Father, speak to us now. Judge and our defender, God, you are loving. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Forever see. We believe. 
fall afresh on our hearts, Lord. Renew this dry soil. Let that be our prayer, that you would fill us so, so much, so much with your love, Lord, that we would overflow in those around us, that they would know the love that you've shown us. So God is your people. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, Starting Grounds Church. Good to see you all this morning. Kids, how was your first week of school? I think parents were the only ones clapping there for some reason. What's happening? Oh, man. Well, you've probably uh, noticed uh, as you walked in, drove in this morning, that the church is getting kind of a little facelift, right? Um, some new paint. Yeah. It's exciting. There's many hands that have been a part of that. So the, Hay, the Hayes family, the Smiths, Davises, there's probably others that I've missed. But, man, thank you for just uh, doing that and stepping up. And the church looks great. So a uh, few announcements here as we just continue to worship in our service. Women's Retreat coming up. Okay, ladies, October 1st through the second that is meeting right here at the church and the theme will be better together okay so connect with um what probably amy davis right over there if you want some more information regarding the women's retreat october 1st through the second okay also women got well, women got the announcements this morning here women of the word okay starting they're meeting again on September 16th, okay, that's from 6.30 to 8 o'clock, that is uh, Thursday evenings right here, so yeah, connect with uh, Viana or maybe maybe uh, this young lady right here, Melinda, so that's going to be great, just a time to, to connect and get into the Word together, so would you pray with me this morning? Before we do that, uh, just continue... Uh, just thank you for your partnership to Starting Grounds Church. And we're, we're a member-supported mission. We don't pass around offering plates, but we just appreciate your faithfulness to what God is calling you to do. And there's, there's ways to do that. There's offering boxes at the exit doors you can give online as well. But thank you for, for, the, for that. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we just uh, commit the rest of this service to you. Thank you, God, for what you're doing in our midst. And... Man, we're just excited uh, about what you're doing with our teens this morning as well and, and the kids moving up. So we just uh, commit the rest of our service to you in your precious name. Amen. Hey, kids. Today we're going to talk about why every Christian kid goes to church. Get ready. You go to church, right? But have you ever thought about why you do it? Ooh, ooh, pick me, pick me. I, I don't, I don't pick me. Anybody? Anybody at all? Yeah, me. Yeah, I don't, I don't mean me. Yeah, yeah, me. How about you back there, the bald one? Uh, I go for the snacks. Uh, snacks are good and all. But that's not why we go to church. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah, me. Me right here, me. I, I know. Hey, how about you over there with the giant ears? Uh, I 
think the boys are cute. That is very ungodly. Anybody else? Please, please pick me. All right, Red, what do you got? I forgot. How about I just tell you? Kids go to church for three main reasons. Reason number one, to learn about Jesus. Did you notice that we learn about Jesus every single week in kids' church? It's important to understand who Jesus is and what he even did for us. And that's why we get together every single week. Memory verse. Let the message about Christ and all its richness fill your lives. Fills my life. Reason number two, to sing together. Please, please, please pick me. No, I'm talking about singing worship songs to Jesus. God loves it when we come together to do that. Singing in church is like saying thanks to God. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. <coughs> I, I can do that. <coughs> uh, reason number three, to help one another. Did you know you have a gift to share with other people at church? Maybe your gift is to be friendly with kids in class. Maybe you're good at memorizing your Bible verses and even sharing them in class. Or maybe you're a good helper and you help your teacher in class. God has given each of you a gift from his variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. So kids, if you don't know what your gift is, talk to your teachers or parents about it. I think we all know what my gift is. Uh I love it that God gives us so many reasons to come to church. We could all stand up and list more than just three, right? But my favorite of those was to help one another and how evident that's been this week with the church being painted and in family camp, all the ways that we loved on one another and in kids' church to know that you guys have a gift and a purpose in your heart that God planted specifically in you. Today, we get to also talk about the fact that Kids' church isn't forever. Wah, wah. As much as I would love to keep all of the kiddos in church with me, we have to move on, right? We've got to grow up, so it's Move Up Sunday. And so I am passing the baton to Pastor Jason in the youth group. We have two friends from Kids' Church that are moving up. We have my own personal daughter, Emily, who has been here since she was 18 months old. So... A long time in kids' church, even though we've had some gaps. It's a, it's a long time. And then Daniel, who's also been here for, gosh, Mama, since he was like four. Yeah, yeah. Born. Oh, well. He wins. He wins. <laughs> oh, goodness. So before we dismiss the kids for kids' church and middle school class this morning, we're going to have a time of prayer. If you feel at all compelled to come up and lay hands on these kiddos, I would love to invite you to do that. Um, I'll invite Scott and Melinda and Daniel and Emily to come up and Pastor Jason as well. And before we pray, I just had a scripture that I wanted to share. Um, it's from... The days where we had worship in Kids Church, you remember that? When we used to sing just kids songs in Kids Church? This was one of the songs we sang, but it's also one of the verses that's very just impactful for not only Kids Church, but if you're a new believer or if you have had a time of dryness in your faith and we feel young in our learning, it is in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, and Paul says, Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. And I hope that you guys will carry those words with you, that in all that you do, God is with you. He has a gift, as our video said. 
in each of your hearts that he wants to see used and blossom for him and for the kingdom. So I will open in prayer and just extend your hands on these kids and, and let's, let's pray as they grow. And then Pastor Jason will close. Heavenly Father, we just come before you this morning, Lord, and we lift up Emily and Daniel. We are so thankful for the opportunity to watch them grow and learn in you. Thank you that we get to be co-laborers with you and their parents to guide them and love them and walk alongside them as they learn what faith looks like for them. Thank you for all the ways that their families have been impactful in our church. Thank you for the gifts that they have that we've gotten to see grow from infancy now on in through their youth and middle school years, Lord. Thank you for Daniel and the ways that he loves on others and what a wonderful friend he is in Kids Church. Please help those gifts that he has blossom in middle school. Help him to have new friends come alongside him that help him grow that he can bond with and connect with even more. Thank you for Emily and her kind spirit and her loving ways and all the ways that she blesses not only her friends in Kids Church, but how she steps up to be a helper and a volunteer too. Let us witness their gifts and come alongside them and help them grow as they continue in their faith journey. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just... Uh commit these two youngsters to you who are just continuing to grow, to understand, to learn what it is to walk this journey of faith. Yeah, I, just, I commit them both to you, that you would just continue to give them a, a deep spiritual understanding of who you are and who you desire them to be in the lives of, of other people. But God, I also just ask for a hedge of protection around them, guard their hearts and their minds that as new challenges arise, as they have new decisions to make, as they continue to, to get older, that you would just guide their steps, give them wisdom. Thank you for their parents who are just loving them in every day and guiding them in the direction that you would have for them. So God, we just continue as a church to pour over them, to speak uh, words of truth, from your word into them, and that they would carry that on through the rest of their lives. So God, we just uh, thank you for Daniel and for Emily. We commit them to you and to your precious and holy name. Amen. Oh, dismiss. This is our first uh, hazing. I mean, no, that's just kidding. <laughs> yes, kids, you're dismissed. From children's church and the middle school class as well. So make your way. Miss Haley is right back there at that door waiting for your kiddos. Uh, good morning. It's great to be here with you all. Yes. What a beautiful, beautiful looking group. I can see all your smiles. It's amazing. Wonderful. Oh, the joys of going into youth group. How many of you guys uh, remember those days? Anybody? Yeah, I don't either. We, we generally uh, repress those kind of memories for later on, right? <laughs> oh, what a good joy. I'm so glad that they get to go through it, not me. Okay. But isn't that funny how we grow and we, we, we remember things that were good, but we're also like, yeah, I'm, I'm good where I'm at. I'm okay being old. It's all right. Yes. We're, we have find joy in the moments of the past and see how God is faithful, but we also see how God is faithful now, and hopefully you're in that place here today, that as you have come here, that you have looked to see and find joy. Last week, we started a series, and before I get into that, I meant to actually mention uh, the class tonight. It's our second week. If you didn't come the first week, it's okay. Come anyways if you'd like, 6 to 7.30. This is our discipleship class on intro to the church. I know that sounds so, so amazing. Uh, you're probably going, oh, tell me more. Uh, but w th tonight we're going to talk about the theology of the church. We went through the kind of a, a history of how it all came from Jesus' disciples to what we see as church today. But we're going to talk about the theology that kind of comes from that 
grand old history. And we're just going to touch on a few of them. But those history things, moments, helped us to formulate a lot of the ways in which we worship and we believe and see. I don't know if you remember th- or heard that song that we sang together that Pastor Megan and Christy led to us. We believe in the Father, right? Okay. That is actually the words of a creed that we have learned. But, but how does that shape and do things. And today we're going to kind of chew on those a little bit and see how many people have kind of challenged those and how some people have leaned into it and brought more clarity to it. So if you're interested in theology and like to talk talk shop like that, please come. This will be a great class for you. But our class in our series of Ask, Seek, Knock comes from this this moment in which Jesus is talking to his disciples and to the crowds and uh, a Sermon on the Mount, and we kind of get in this place where he says, ask, and it'll be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door will be open. And he says, what father gives his son a stone if he asks for bread, right? Who gives him a snake, something that's poisonous and unclean, if he asks for something else, right? Like, we get this, this phrase that we kind of conjure up in our minds, in our Western ways of thinking, and a lot of times we think, oh, well, if I just ask, I get, right? Uh, The downfall is that it puts us in a very dangerous spot when we start thinking about who God is, because as we kind of said, if you're praying and asking God to give you this job, what does it mean for God to listen to your prayer over the other person who's praying the same thing? God doesn't play favoritism. He's a God who who does so much more, and this phrase and this thing that Jesus is challenging in the Greek is more like this. If we were to rephrase it to more the emphasis of not the result, but the actual motion of the asking, it would say, if you want to receive, ask. If you want to find, seek. If you want the door open, knock. See the difference between the two emphasis? That here, it is not about receiving, it is about the journey to ask. It, that the desire to lean into something and say, God, would you help me to understand? And so what we were doing is to see that, that the emphasis is not on the result, but is on the, the action of the ask. What we want to also see that it's got this continuation type emphasis that's going on. In other words, this is not just... Well, I asked, and I didn't receive. It's not this, uh, how many guys that used to play uh, hide-and-seek with your kids when they were little? And you're like, yeah, you go hide. I'll, I'll be there in a minute. And then you decide to finish what you're doing. I'm still trying to find you. <laughs> right? Just a little bit of break. That's not the type of seeking it's talking about. It's talking about continuous, active seeking where you're really looking. And so this scripture is for us to see that for us to receive, for us to find, for us to have the doors open, it requires us to be fervent in the ways in which we look for it. And I challenged you last week to kind of say, this should be a joy for us, and that this is a joy and a journey full of tension, that when we seek, it's not an easy answer. It is not, let me give you the 10 reasons why you need to do this or that, but that it it should stir on more questioning and more processing. If I say, trust in the Lord, lean not on your own understanding, you're like, yes, I don't know what that means. Because if we really seek what it means to trust the Lord and not lean on our understanding, we've got to ask a whole lot of other questions. What does it mean for me to have, not think about me, but think about who God, what God is? Who is God? How do I know it's his voice and not my voice? All these questions, and it creates this tension in us that we'd rather not feel. But there's a joy in that tension. There's a joy in that, and there is where we find fullness of life. Can I tell you that culturally, I I see this pendulum swing in the ways in which we decide on how we believe or how we stand on things. Have you guys noticed that? You're like, I feel tension over here. I don't like that. I'm going to swing on over here. Oh, yep, tension there too, right? And we're just swinging back and forth like we're on a wrecking ball. Oh, 
I was on a wrecking ball. Oh, sorry. I know you guys are like, sinner. <laughs> Sorry, I'm sure I wasn't the only one thinking about that. So, But either way, we get in this pendulum swing about what truth is and what is right or what is wrong. And we get this very extreme values. And the tension lies in the middle. If you can imagine yourself pushing your kid on the swing, it gets very easy to push your kid on the swing. And if you're not careful, you forget that when there's an equal push, there's an equal give back, and it comes back at you. The difficult thing about pushing your kids in swings is when they say, I'm done, I'm done, stop. And what do you do as a good parent? You grab hold of it, and you get dragged with it. Because there's tension, and the tension is in the middle. And can we be a people, as we seek these questions, as we seek for answers and truth, can we feel the tension of the middle? That we are not looking to be extremists, but there is something about being in the middle of things to say that it is a both and many times when we look at scripture. That it's not just one or the other, that there's, there's certain paradoxes in which we see our world to be. That the heart pumps blood, but it is also something that breaks emotionally. And if we only look at the truth of the science of a heart, we miss a whole section of life that we don't understand. And so, yes, physically, the heart pumps blood so that our, all our organs and our extremities can have ways of motion and life. But if we ignore the idea that there's a broken heart in this room, that no matter how much blood flows in and out of it, the loss that they felt doesn't necessarily make that better. Can we be a people who see the both ands in our answers? Today, we tackle a question, actually multiple questions, questions that came to us, and thank you for so many of you who gave questions. We're going to start where I think is a very foundational thing for us as a church. I think this might help you in answering some of the other questions that we have had. And I'm going to frame these, kind of pocket these all in together, because although we have time and we have other Sundays, but I'm not sure we want this to be a year-long series. But this question, one was, how do I balance a life of holiness, which I know is a, a phrase that some of us already have questions about. <laughs> how do I balance uh, living holy, living faithfully, and not leaning too far into legalism? In other words, now I'm all about rules. How do I balance that? Some were, how do I become Essentially, the essence of it, what does it mean for us to not be of the world, but in the world? How do we balance to not be cluttered and melding in with culture that, how do we determine what is of us and what is not of us, and how we interact with that? Because that becomes a question, too. Do we accept this portion of our life into that, or do we just cut ties? See, holiness is something there that, that is questions that... That comes into more of moral standards of, is drinking okay? And sure, we can answer those questions and we can go individually, but if we don't have this understanding of holiness, we won't really understand how to journey those other questions. And so today, I'd like to journey into this idea of us being a holy people. What it means for us to be set apart for God. And how we're to do that. Of course, that won't answer all the extreme things, the subjective things and other questions that might draw to this idea of holiness. But my hope is, is that we give you a framework, a foundation to stand upon to journey forward. I want you to know that I am not here to just be the pastor who draws up tension in your life and says, all right, see you later. Have a good one. That my hope is, is that you find the people around you to journey in that tension. But if you have nobody, I would love to grab a cup of coffee with you and chat about the tensions and the questions that are of your heart. With no judgment, no worry, just let's try to figure out what God has for you in your life. So today we start with a, a uh, scripture by First Peter. And this is more of just kind of a call to being holy 
And of course, it has a lot of theological process, but I'm going to draw a picture for you at the end of this this day after we kind of understand what holiness is. But would you read with me what Peter says, 1 Peter 1 through 13 through 25. And if you're in your Bibles in front of you, towards the back portion of your of your Bible, a small little letter, okay? It's uh, before 2 Peter, if that helps. <laughs> uh, for those of you who have been in church long enough, that doesn't help, so. Yes. And this is what it says. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed in his coming. Verse 14. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as you were called, you or called just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. For you know that it was not uh, with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were de- redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope in God, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart, for you have been born again, do not, not, to, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and their, all their glory is like flowers of the field. The grass withers and the fall, flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. This is the word that was preached to you. Amen. God, to help us. Help us to understand this idea of holiness. God, we want to live faithfully. I believe many of us don't argue that we don't want to be that. But God, putting it in practice, put it into practice of, of what it looks like for our lives, we, we have great questions. Help us to understand, God. Help us to, to be able to framework so that we can walk in this world and be able to decide how you want us to move. Help us, Lord, to understand what it means to be kadosh, holy. We love you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Holiness. What is this holiness thing? In our tradition here at Starting Grounds Church, the Nazarene tradition bases itself in this holiness. And this, we won't get into our tradition and how that might be a something that helps us to understand the full picture of holiness. But it's something that essentially comes down to this word of kadosh, which is, which is uh, in Hebrew, this word really was used that uh, in the moments of burning bush, or uh, as the, we have these images of, in Revelation, where it says, holy, 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 right? Or when it says, it reveals uh, to Isaiah, and I stood in there, and, and the seraphim the the angels were saying holy 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 it's kadosh 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 and it's this idea of being separate set apart something that is completely other than what it's in in other words because you're in this room you don't become part of this room you are completely other from this room although you're part right and God is this holy other, this thing that, that we look at. The, the best way to look at it is it's coined by this person who, who back in the early 1900s, had a book called, I'm sorry, uh, back up. Rudolf Otto writes a book in 1917. Rudolf Otto was a, a German uh, philosopher theologist that began to coin this term of the holy other not just h-o-l-y but the w-o-l-l-y this holy other like the separate thing from it 
And it, it was used by other people like C.S. Lewis and many others, but he was the one who coined it. And he talked about that God is this holy other, this separate thing that is this mysterium tre tremendum. Mysterium tremendum, the, the mysterious terror <laughs> is essentially what it means. And you're like, whoa, 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 that's not the God I know. God, God's not terrifying. But yes, he is. That there's this mysterious tremendum, this, this terror and fearfulness that we see in the holiness of God. He says that there's also this thing about God that in this mysterious tremendum, it, it acts in grace, that there's a gracefulness to it. And in this holiness, this... Uh, Numia, or, uh, numinous is, is this idea that God is this holy other who is this mysterium tremendum. And what he does is in this book of ideal, the idea of the holy, God addresses this idea of holy other. C.S. Lewis puts it like this, and this is a great way for us to understand it. Suppose you were told that there was a tiger in the next room. Scott, there's not one, so you can settle. Okay. You would know that you were in danger, but you would probably feel, fe and you would probably feel fear. But if you were told that there was a ghost in the next room and believed it, you would feel indeed what is often called fear, but a different kind. It would be, it would not be based on the knowledge of danger, for no one is primarily afraid of what a ghost may do to him, but of the mere fact that it is a ghost. It is uncanny rather than dangerous. A special kind of fear that excites uh, may be called dread. With the uncanny, one can reach the fringes of numinous. Right? This idea of mysterious terror. Now suppose that you were told simply there is a mighty spirit in the room and believed it. Your feelings would be then of even less like uh, the fear of danger, but the disturbance would be profound. You would f feel wonder and certain shrinking, a sense of inadequacy to cope with such a visitant and a prostration before it, an emotion that, is, that might be expressed in Shakespeare's word, under my genius, is rebuke. This feeling may be described as awe, an object that excites it, as the numinous. In other words, we can talk about how we fear God like a tiger in the other room, or we could address it kind of this mysterious excitement of God being a ghost or spirit, this holy other that we don't know how to interact with. It's interesting that we have this idea of numinous. We see it in scripture and we often pass over it, don't we? How many of you guys have seen the movie, uh, The Ten Commandments, or The Prince of Egypt? We watch this show and we understand and we highlight the ideas of how Moses goes and leads the people of Israel, but we kind of pass this big story of the burning bush, don't we? We kind of go, oh yeah, it was somehow a bush that wasn't really getting burned, it was just kind of out in the desert, and okay, let's move on. <laughs> but we have this really extravagant, numinous type experience where he's experiencing this bush. And he gets to walk up to this bush at a certain point until God begins to address him. And what does he tell him to do? He essentially says, take off your sandals, for the ground you stand on is sacred, holy. Interesting. Now, some of us would be thinking that God just doesn't like dirt around his bush. I don't know. But maybe it's more in the fact that there's reverence there. Perhaps there was something unclean in the sandals. I don't know. How many of you guys don't do shoes in your house simply because of the dirt it brings in? Yes? Why couldn't God be that simple? See, he puts that in. And he says that there's something on you. There's something on that you don't come back. That if I get too close... I'm going to burn up. In this holy otherness of the burning bush, it wasn't that God said, come, give me a hug. 
That's a different type of response to the holy, isn't it? We don't say that to the holy things of our life, do we? In fact, it's more like an experience of looking up at the sky and the stars in the middle of the night and imagining that we're on a giant rock spinning through air. (laughs) Have you guys ever thought about that and felt, I feel small? (laughs) Yeah. And he stands there before him, and in order for him, he needed to be cleansed of his shoes in order to approach any farther to the bush. This is a journey that just doesn't even it stop, doesn't stop there. It stops as God interacts. You see that on Mount Sinai and how he interacts. And God says, you can't get too close. You need to do certain things. You need to cover your face. You need to do these things to be able to see me. All the way to the point in which they begin to build a temple. And at, back in the Jewish t- time, during this time when the temple was made, they have the courtyards where kind of everyone kind of be around. And then there's the, the court, or I mean the, the outside, which everyone could be part of. The courtyard was where the rabbis could be. And then only one day a year, the high priest that came with the full atonement, the, the sacrifice, could go into the Holy of Holies, that one place. Some Jewish records talk about they would actually tie a rope to that priest around his ankle so that way if he died in the midst of interaction with God, they could pull him out. (laughs) Can you imagine being that job? And I thought my job was tough, (laughs) right? But there's this mysterium, this mysterium tremendum that is created in the culture. And in order for that priest to interact in the Holy of Holies, there were cleansing processes for them to make it ritually safe for them to be in. They had to clean, they had to, to sacrifice, they had to do all the right things in order to go through. But then there's a switch in scripture with Isaiah, isn't there? Isaiah comes in, he has this vision. Can you imagine having a dream where you wake up and you're in a place where you know you're not supposed to be? That's kind of what Tim Mackey says about this. He says, Isaiah wakes up and he, he has this vision of standing in the throne room of God. Can you imagine what he thought as a Jewish person? I didn't do, I didn't do all those, those sacrifices. Like, it, it's like that feeling of going to school in your underwear, right? Like, I didn't do some of the things I needed to do to be here. And holiness for him, he comes to a place where, woe is me. In other words, he is in complete terror with the holy other. But something great happens in the fact that the seraphim comes with the coal to touch his lips. And after he touches his lips, he says, your sins are washed and you have been atoned for. What a brilliant story. What a different interaction with the holy. That somehow in movements of the church, they have created that they have to cleanse themselves to interact with the holy one. And here you have the holy one cleansing the servant. That w- there was a belief that all these things make us dirty, right? You have Leviticus that talks about not touching blood or the, those things that are dead or molds or all these different things that we create in our head that are make us unclean and we have to cleanse ourselves of it in order to interact. And here we have God interacting with the unclean who cleans them and transforms them for his service. Because after he's transformed for that service, he says, now who shall I send? He says, here I am, send to me. Holiness is this weird, mysterium, tremendum. We see this in Paul's Paul's interaction on the road of Damascus, don't we? We see this weird, mysterious terror that falls onto him. But God comes and cleanses and transforms him for the service in which is before him. We see it in the disciples with the resurrected Christ. That you have this gentleness of coming in and saying, you are cleansed of it. With Peter who says, you may have denied me, but do you love my church? He says, feed my sheep. There's a redeeming quality with the interaction of the Holy. And we have this gift of the Holy Spirit, don't we? That in that, we are transformed when we interact with the Holy. Holiness is passed on to us. 
in our story. That in scripture, holiness is passed on to us. It's not something that is there in the distance, but we see him coming, transforming and cleansing us for his service. There's a measure of mysterium tremendum in that process, though, isn't there? Tonight, we'll talk briefly about a guy named John Wesley, who has this experience in his doubt where his heart is strangely warmed. What a cool phrase. Have you been interacted with the Mysterium Tremendum, the Holy Other? Have you had that moment where you just kind of go, that was an experience I cannot put my finger on? Can I tell you that is God pursuing you, the Holy interacting with you, not requiring you to cleanse yourself, but for him to cleanse you, to transform you, and to know you. We see this in the story over and over in the ways in which Jesus doesn't wait for the unclean to cleanse themselves to come to him, but he walks amongst the streets, touching the woman who is ailing of sickness and healing them, the lame who can't walk, the blind who can't see, and he touches them and he cleanses them. This interaction with the holy is something that pursues them and goes to them, not because they're dirty and that they needed to get better, but because he pursued them to transform them for their service. That's where we come to holiness. And you might be saying, Pastor Ben, how does that help me? First of all, can I just encourage us to understand that just because God pursues us, that doesn't make him safe. That he doesn't become this person that that can be manipulated. It's not somebody that we can control or decide what is and what isn't. In other words, there is a standard to holiness. God might reach into the unclean, but he is calling them to a standard of wellness. That requires reform and transformation, and transformation is difficult, isn't it? Transformation is hard, and sometimes it's not what the heart wants, is it? Sometimes we have to make changes. Sometimes God's calling us to make changes because he knows it does no wellness for you and doesn't prepare you for his service. In a world that we live in, sometimes it's hard to have a standard. But remember, the standard is not for them is for you to interact with the mysterium tremendum, the holiness, the holy other, the one who has the ability to bring healing upon you. That is the standard. The standard is for you to interact with him and to have a covenant with him because with that is going to give you all things. That's going to be the thing that supplies everything for you. Not living a life of just doing better. Spiritual dryness is real, isn't it? And it happens when we don't allow us to remember that God is holy and that we approach him in certain ways. Sometimes we approach our spiritual practices through, well, I just need to do better. And I've been told I need to read the Bible. And so then we read the Bible and then we kind of just fake it, make it, and try to figure out what we were supposed to do with that. What if we viewed this time as an opportunity for the Spirit to come and pursue us, this holy other who can transform your life, to whatever brokenness that is in you and in your life, God has the ability to heal that. But you've got to trust him. You've got to allow him to move. When God calls and puts you to a standard, let him transform you. That's holiness. When we step into God's holiness, we become the reason that the world sees that we are holy. Not our holiness, But it comes from the God's holiness, his numinous, his holy otherness, isn't it? I I know I've thrown a lot of us at here. There's a lot here that we've looked at and we can see how God has moved his people from this understanding that I can't approach you till I'm clean. How many of you guys lived into that way too long? I've got to get my life before I can go in. And yet, God, we see time and time again saying, no, 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 no. I come to you and I cleanse and transform you. I give you 
the gift of the Holy Spirit and transformation. And the standard is not to live for the world to be better, but it's for you to live into the transformation that God has called you into. That it's not about the moral code. Because if we forget that we're inter interacting with the holy other and that our standard is for him and him alone to embody us, we simply go back to the trying to do good and hope that God does. How many of you guys have done that before? Well, I just need to do better, so that's why I'm here. And we try and try again, but then we wonder why we fall short, why we're still plagued with the illness that ensues us. Because transformation is much in, more in-depth than that. There's a few things that happen when we try to just do good. It, it works for a while, doesn't it? Right? Okay, I did, I did better. I did good. How many of you guys try to eat better, eat healthier, exercise? Yeah. First day you're feeling good. Yeah. I'm going to be new slim me. I've been trying to lose the same 15 pounds for the past 10 years. You know what I mean? <laughs> and on top of that, there's more pounds that add on to it. I don't know what's going on. But either way, it's this process that, that transformation takes. That trying to do good sometimes isn't enough. And, and that's not what God is asking us to do. When he calls us to be holy, he's saying, would you trust me? Would you put your heart in my hands and let me be the one who cleanses it? And that means approaching him in spiritual practices that mean something. That when you approach his word, it's to interact with the holy other. That prayer is not just this hope of like, God, I'm going to ask and hope you give, but it's a earnest seeking God can you have and do whatever it is I surrender all how often do we preach and hear and sing the songs I surrender all have we ever thought the depths of the songs that we sing and yet it rolls off our lips in hoping that it's going to do something Instead, it becomes like a Novocaine shot that doesn't allow us to feel or know how to interact with pain. And yet, God's holiness helps us to interact in a broken and painful world and not necessarily dismiss it, but begin to be a place in which we show them where transformation happens. Holiness is something that's far beyond just doing good. To kind of put a picture to this. I, I'd like to kind of utilize an analogy, and can I just tell you that it's probably not a perfect analogy? No, none of them are. We could probably look at the nuances, of it, but can you, can you just help this to be the framework that you walk away with? This is your heart. This is your heart on drugs. No, I'm just kidding. No, okay, so. Right? I've been wanting to do that all week. Sorry. <laughs> but this, this is your heart. It, and a lot of times what we do to do good is we, we say, oh, it's broken, it's empty, right? Like it's got a little crack here. I know I'm not an artist. I apologize. And so what we do is we start taking our pens and like, well, I'm going to go to church and try to fill that in, right? Like we try to do all this stuff of like, oh, that crack, how do I, how do I mask that crack? Anybody got duct tape, Right? We're doing all these things to try to make it healed. And at the time, what God is saying, no, 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 no. I just need you to come to me. Here, give it to me. Give it to me. Scott, can I, can I ask you to come on up for a moment? <laughs> you don't have to do much. Give it up for Scott. It, the, did I... Can I just tell you that this is when I wish I really invested some time and energy into the circus arts. I wanted to like, like juggle these. I wanted to do sleight of hand. I couldn't do it. It wasn't going to be that good. But what happens is, Scott, you're going to be God. Don't let it get to your head, okay? <laughs> just for the moment. You're God, and God's saying, Ben, stop trying to do good. Just, just give it to me. Just give it to me. And when we put it in his hands, it actually changes out to a whole heart. 
Because God begins to transform it. It begins to heal it. Do you know that the things, when I put my heart in God's hands, that there are things I used to struggle then that I don't struggle anymore? Do you know the things that you struggle with now, when you put it in God's hands, you won't struggle for it forever. There will be times where you'll have peace. You'll have rest. But here's the thing. Me or us trying to color our pieces in in the brokenness of what's going on is not going to bring full healing to us. What it's going to require is saying, God, I trust you. You're the one who I see is going to care for this. You ever uh, think about how people hold eggs? I, I thought about using water balloons for this. But you know what? You know what Scott, see how Scott's doing this? If I gave him a water balloon, what do you think Scott would do? He started to squeeze it. <laughs> like, and it's a subconscious value of like, how hard do I have to throw it in order for it to break on you? But an egg is this gentle thing, this thing that is fragile inside. And here's the great thing is when I put that into him, he begins to transform it. He begins to make it whole. And what has he prepared my heart to do? See, now I don't have, I've got hands. I don't have to care for my heart anymore. My heart's being cared by the, the Holy One. So what can I do? Just like Isaiah, you've cleansed me. He goes, whom shall I send? Send me. And God begins to place other things in your life. Not your broken heart, because things that are breaking your heart are breaking his, and he's transforming your heart. But God places people with broken hearts in your life, don't they? Now you're caring for them. Now you're calling them to... Let me help you. Let me walk that journey of brokenness with you. It, it, it's the embodiment of his holiness through us. But what we can't do is this, is when we try to do good, how many of you guys have ever tried to do good and you found yourself holding everyone's heart? And you're like... <laughs> and then God's like, yeah, and you're like, oh, there's my heart. Oh, oh, oh. And then your heart's dropping, you know, and it's broken. You're like, ah. And then you have to take all the things that you're trying to do and put them back down. And you're just like, I can't help you anymore. I've got to care for myself. Instead, I know it's broken now. It's hard-boiled. It's okay. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's in there. And you're holding on to people's God, heart. It is not our job to heal the broken hearts around us, is it? Because the holiness we have is not our holiness, but whose? God's. And so we become like the transfer of, can I show you a safe place to put your heart? Can I show you a safe place? And then more, can I show you a safe place where you'll be cared for? See, we only become the hands and the feet and the body of Christ we are not the healer. We are not the holy one. But here's the thing is until I release my heart, I am only trying to balance my heart with all the broken hearts around me. I've got to release it to allow transformation. Or how many of you guys had broken heart and you just broke somebody else's because of the way you were feeling? We don't do that, do we? When we feel bad, we make other people feel bad. Oh, no. <laughs> Got a mental health counselor back there who's like. <laughs> Care for your heart first. Give it to God. And then when you're caring with others, you can care for it with a depth of care that you could never do with holding them all. Just transfer it over to the safe one. This is where I wish you, you were a magician and you just and then have nice, clean, whole hearts, but it's not going to work, so, yeah. unless you're holding back on me. No, no. Okay, so, <laughs> but here's the thing, thank you, give it up for Scott. <laughs> when we address this with the idea of holiness... It comes with an interaction of a God that can't be tamed, can't be manipulated, but only 
approached with pure reverence. With the idea that you hold my heart in your hands. And although you have the ability to do what you want with it, you care with it well. Again, I'm that big C.S. Lewis fan, but I love in Chronicles of Narnia where they're at the Mr. Beaver's home. And they first hear of the, the lion Aslan. You guys know that story? Aslan's the Christ figure in there. And they start talking about this lion, and the kids are like, lion? Is he tame? And Mr. Beaver says, no, but he's good. We have a God that is not tame, but he is good, and he will care for your heart. And he's not one who takes it lightly. He's not one who will give it away or sell it on Amazon. He is going to be a God who cares for it as long as you allow him to. That's what it means to be holy. God doesn't just give it up, but he's not going to hold it hostage either. God's going to take your heart, care for it, unless you say otherwise. And when it comes to interacting with a world full of broken hearts, It's not saying that you need to have a whole heart like ours. That standard is for us. So that we can have that interaction and covenant with the God Almighty. What God calls us to do is to to love them and care for them like he loves us. To be an incarnation, a, a, a flesh and blood value of who he is. And then to point them in the direction of the one who can bring the full healing. When we talk about standards and morality, we talk about being holy as he is holy, can we stop waving our holiness around like a giant stick, trying to get people to obey the things we love? Rather, can we be a people who become the hands and feet because we're cared for by the God who loves us? that we put our trust in him. Now we can go and do that. Now we can care for the orphans and the widows, the broken and the hearted. There is where what it means to be holy, for he is holy. I say, Ben, that doesn't really answer my question, though. How, <laughs> how do I figure out, then, what it looks like to trust or what it looks like for, for me to hold on to other people's hearts? That's the tension. That's something that's not preached in this sermon. It's something that you seek and you ask and you find and ask God that to open those doors for you to experience. But one thing I can say is at the end of that scripture in Matthew, you have all these things about ask, seek, find, knock, and the door will be open. And then it says, and just so you know, loving God and loving the people as you would have them be loved covers all the things of the laws and the prophets. So perhaps that's the question you ask yourself. How do I love the world? How do I care for broken hearts? It's always in light of loving God and then how you would want to be treated yourself. And not just how you would want to be treated, but how God has treated you as well. May you place your heart in the hands of Jesus. He's not tame, but he's good. Can you be a people who are willing to hand your heart over to allow him to transform you? Don't wait to be cleansed to approach God. You don't have to go through purification things to walk into this building and experience a God's touch upon your life. 
what it does mean to hand over your life to him. To trust him. And wait for the call when he says, who shall I send? May your heart joyfully say, send me. That is be holy, for I am holy. Let us pray. God, help us to see that your holiness is not something that you hold over our heads or that you, something that you have held from even a distance, but God, somehow you found a way from your mysterious terror of who you are to find an intimate way to interact with us, God. We thank you for pursuing us, God, not to allow our uncleanliness to, to keep us from you, but God, you pursued us in a way in which you transformed our hearts. That for some of us who had that experience with your holiness, God, only allowed us to be free to serve you in ways in which we never could have through trying to heal ourselves. God, I pray for those who need healing here, those who may have not handed over their heart to you, I pray that this will be an opportunity for them to do that. It doesn't mean that everything's going to be right or good right away. But you would begin to shape them and guide them. And that would be all in light of a covenant and a relationship with you, God. That you'd renew people who feel worthless. That you remind people that they're loved despite what they've done. That you pursue them in ways and transform them in ways in which they have bought into the brokenness of their heart. May they lean into you to see that you, they will be well cared for in your hands. For those of us who have experienced that, who have already trusted you, may we praise you, God. May we praise you because you have transformed us and allowed us to no longer struggle with the things we used to struggle with. But it doesn't mean we don't have things we struggle with now. And help us, God, to still trust you. To not ask for our heart to go back. But that, God, you are still in good care for our hearts. I also pray for those who have answered the call. That your holiness is something that they have taken on, that you have embodied them in ways in which they have reached out in their world. And that you've placed broken hearts in their lives. Pray, God, that you would strengthen them. Grant them wisdom. Help them not to be the ones who try to heal the world, but they try to hand them over to you. May we not be a people who work with our own abilities, but simply out of something that you have granted us. May the world see that we are in good care in your body, simply because you transformed us first. May this be a church, God, that cares for the broken, the lost, the poor, the lonely, the frustrated, the ill, not just physically, but mentally as well. May we be a people that step into a holiness that takes the hearts of people in our hands and find themselves cared for. God, our desire is to be holy because we interacted with the one who is holy. Pray these things in the name of Christ, the one who was and is, who will always be.
Lord, as we think upon these words, as we meditate upon the call to give you our hearts, Lord, may you remember that you have already done the good work. You've already started it. You've already completed all that's needed for us to be faithful. So God, as we go out this week, may you enact that good work in us, Lord. As your people, Lord, we trust in you. We ask that you'd send us from this place in your peace. And all of God's children said, amen.
Have a great week, friends.